So thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me. This is actually my first official visit to Simons. So it's, it's, it's very nice. Um, although I do still get stuck in the stairwell after 5 p.m. each day, but I, I need to go to the student center. And, okay. All right. So this is joint work with Tom. And um, you may know that in some sense, the most classic model in physics for which Monte Carlo algorithms were developed is not the Ising model and not graph coloring. It's the hard disk model. So here's this 1953 paper, which, uh, you know, Metropolis et al., four out of five of the authors were two married couples. And uh, so here they used one of the early electronic computers, the Maniac, to study the hard disk model. And more, more generally, they looked at interacting particles in two and three dimensions with various kinds of potentials or forces between them. Um, but uh, so they did these numerical calculations with n equals 224. And uh, so at the time, this was impressive. And they used a, a local Markov chain where you would grab a random disk and uh, come up with some random displacement for it, but uh, you know, nearby. And then if moving it by that amount would cause it to overlap another disk, you reject the move and do nothing. And otherwise, you do the move. All right. So they did this to understand the equation of state, sort of how the pressure uh, varies with the density and so on. Um, so here's the notation we're going to use. We have n disks in the unit square. It'll have cyclic boundary conditions, so it's the unit torus, which means each one has radius 1 over root n um, times some constant. And I'll use rho, the density, to mean the total area covered by all the disks. So the area of each one, 4 pi r squared times n. And um, so the disks may not overlap. So the centers of two disks may not be within a distance 2r. So uh, we, think, we think of each disk, it's a radius r, but it's surrounded by a kind of danger zone of radius 2r in which the center of other disks may not be. Now, um, for independent sets on graphs, the discrete version of this problem it seems to be more popular uh, in the literature to consider the model where the number of disks varies. And we weight configurations by lambda to the n for some fugacity lambda. And that is also a very worthy model. Um, and as you may know, physicists call that the grand canonical ensemble. But for us, the, the number of disks and the density will be fixed. So yes? What's the density for pi r I mean, the, the area covered by a disk is? Is to the pi r squared, right? Oh, yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. <laughs> I made these slides late last night. Yes, yeah, sorry. The total area of the danger zones will be at most this by the union bound. But yes, but they that force. Right? Of course, they can cross. Oh, I'm giving away everything now. <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks. Uh, good. <laughs> okay, good. Th thank you. Any questions? All right. <clears throat> All right, so before we try to prove things, let's find out what the truth is. And uh, there's an amazing amount of phenomenology in the system. So, of course, when the, uh, when the density is at a certain amount, the density of a close packing of disks, then the only uh, available state is a triangular close packing. And here's the three-dimensional version of that, um, courtesy of... Uh, Tom and Varsha's daughter, Shreya. Um, but then at a density around 0.7, there is a phase transition from a kind of liquid or gaseous state where everything has a lot of room to move to a state which is called a solid. Um, although, in fact, what we mean by solid in the continuous setting in two dimensions turns out to be very quite subtle. So there are actually two different types of order we could imagine. One is positional order, what you imagine in a crystal, where there's some periodicity to the positions of the disks. There is a more subtle kind of order, orientational order, where um, the, the angle between two neighboring disks far away is correlated with the angle between two neighboring disks here. And you might think these are the same. Um, but so first of all, uh, in two dimensions, there's this classic thing called the Perl's argument that says that we can't actually have correlations that don't decay at all with long distance. They have to decay at least polynomially. Um, 
and so in the liquid or gaseous phase, they decay exponentially. There is also, experimentally, a very narrow range of densities with a fascinating thing called the hexatic phase, where the positional correlations decay exponentially, but the orientational correlations decay only polynomially. So what this means is that if I tell you that there's a disk here, it doesn't tell you much at all about the position of a disk here. And yet, if I tell you that this disk has a neighbor at this angle, it does make it more likely that this disk has a neighbor at that angle. So, you know, this, this was conjectured on physical grounds a while ago, and it was only recently, with the help of new Markov chains, which are not the ones we're studying, that there was convincing numerical evidence for this. So there are these little arrows here describing the, the orientation. You know, of course, there are six different directions you could take typically to one of your six nearest neighbors. But this blue area here is a whole bunch of the world that has roughly the same orientational order. And there's even this coexistence between um, ordered and disordered areas. Here's some more, even more recent numerical experiments. This is with a million disks, by the way. And these stripes here are where there are positional correlations because things are kind of roughly stacked with the same orientation. So it's a very fascinating system. There's much more going on, it seems, than just liquid versus solid or gaseous versus solid. In any case, we're going to do something infinitely more modest today, um, which is studying a particular uh, Markov chain. So here, uh, at each step, we choose a uniformly random disk from the n disks. We choose a uniformly random position in the entire world, and we attempt to move it there. And uh, we do so unless, it cause it, unless doing that would cause it to overlap another disk. So we'd like to know when this mixes rapidly. So I'm going to start by reviewing this result of Cannon, Mahoney, and Montenegro, that it mixes rapidly up to uh, 1 eighth, so order n log n time for rho less than 1 eighth. They also proved polynomial time for rho equals 1 eighth. Um, our result is up to 0.154, which compared to 0.125 is not an amazing improvement, especially given that the truth is 0.7. Um, but I hope you'll like the techniques. And uh, yeah, I hope you'll like the techniques. We will also show kind of, mostly, we're still working on it. This is a workshop. This is, a, you know, so, you know, come on. So welcome to my workshop. The tools are still scattered all over the table. Um, uh, we, we think we can prove uh, spatial mixing up to that same density, although I'll try to convince you that the connection between optimal temporal mixing and spatial mixing is slightly harder to establish in this case than it is in cases you may be familiar with. All right. So lots of our speakers have already reminded us of path coupling. So we define a neighborhood relationship between two states. In our case, that will be if they disagree on the position of a single disk. And then we, if we define some metric, then you know, Bubbly and Dyer tell us that if on every path of a shortest path through the state space, the expected distance contracts multiplicatively in expectation, then so does the total distance. And then we would get n log n mixing time. OK, so here's what these folks did. Um, they say, OK, so suppose you disagree on the location of a single disk. That'll be the ith disk. So xi and yi are different xj equals yj for all other j. So we choose a random disk, j, and a location, z. And usually, we try to move both disks to that location. But if that location is in the danger zone of either disks, then we try to move uh, xj to that location. But we try to move yj to its mirror image reflected around this line bisecting the line between x and y. So this is a lot like Jerem's trick for Glauber dynamics in graph coloring, where you swap the two forbidden colors. And the point is we want to correlate the events that these, uh, that these moves succeed or fail. So this way, for instance, if I try to move uh, x here and it would overlap, uh, if I try to move xj here and it would overlap with xi, then that same move uh, here, will, the move will fail in the y chain as well because it will overlap with yi. Um, alrighty. So, um, so what can happen? Well, there are good moves and bad moves. Uh, remember, this is the only disagreement between these two. So if we succeed in moving them both 
to the same location, then the disagreement disappears and the distance decreases by one. And the probability of that is 1 over n, the probability that we choose to move the ith disk, uh, times the total area of the available space, so the fraction of the world where we can move a disk, which is 1 minus the union of all the danger zones. So here we're going to use, there's the 4. But, you know, was, that, that's where it was supposed to be. It escaped. Um, so by the uh, union bound, that, er that fraction of the world is, a, is at least 1 minus 4 times the density. You see that, right? Yes? How, what do you mean by move? Uh, if if uh, you, have, you need a path uh, in between? No. So you just, uh, no, you pick it up and put it down over there. And reappear somewhere. Right, right. Yes? That was exactly my question. Okay. Yeah, I mean... I mean, so again, the original Markov chain that people used in 1953 did local moves. So you can imagine bad initial conditions where a lot of the disks are clustered in one corner of the world, and then the local move would maybe take quite a while, presumably polynomial time for things to diffuse out of there, whereas this global move dynamics might, uh, by teleporting things, might uh, mix more quickly. Okay, so that's uh, a lower bound on the probability of a good move. Then a bad move is where we take a disk that we already agreed on before, and we succeed in one or both chains, moving it here or leaving it there, or moving it here or leaving it there, so that now we have a disagreement um, on the jth disk as well. The probability of that is at most the area of Y's danger zone, because again, if we try to, tell, if we try to move X into X's danger zone, and Y into the mirror image, both moves will fail. Okay, so again, as in, as in uh, Jerem's trick, we only, you know, if, if we hadn't thought of this mirror image thing, there'd be a factor of two here because both danger zones would be dangerous to us. Okay, we being they. All right, so um, when we combine this, we get that the expected distance decreases as long as uh, row is less than one eighth. Good. All righty. So, what are the ingredients? You know, stepping back, viewing this field uh, somewhat from the outside. How do we make these things fly? So, um, in this case, we used a very simple Markov chain. This global move dynamics is clearly very simple. We were a bit clever about the coupling. Um, just as in that classic coupling for Glauber dynamics. But of course, there are other things you can do. You can try to be more clever with the chains. So in the world of um, independent sets on graphs, for instance, uh, Dyer and Greenhill and I guess and, and Luby and Vigoda uh, considered moves, uh, an expanded Markov chain where in addition to adding and removing things from the independent set, you also try sliding things to their neighbors. And then you can get an improvement in the critical fugacity by optimizing the rate at which you do those slide moves. Um, but you can also be clever with the metrics. So there's a paper by Eric where he gets the, the same improvement, um, but with the simple original Markov chain, but changing the metric instead, saying that, well, let's, if, if two states have a disagreement, but most of the ways for them to gain a new disagreement are blocked by neighbors farther away, well, then they're less likely to move farther away, so morally they seem closer together, so let's count them as closer together. So then there's a coefficient that you optimize there in that metric, and you get uh, the same improvement. So there seems to be some kind of trade-off here between being cleverer with the chain versus cleverer with the metric, and that was part of our motivation. Our other motivation, of course, is that maybe because computer science uh, has this, this odd focus on discrete valued things, I'm, I'm not sure why something to do with the nature of electronics. Um, there has been relatively little work on continuous valued state spaces. Uh, an important exception is by uh, Dana and Peter Winkler, where they looked at moving points around on an interval or on a circle, which is in a sense the one-dimensional version of, of this problem. Okay, good. So here's what we're going to do. Um, it seems that if if two states disagree in the location of a single disk, if they don't disagree very much, if those disks are almost in the same place, that should count for less. Rather than just saying, oh, it's Hamming distance, it counts for one whenever they disagree even a little. 
So we're going to define the, the difference as some function little d of the distance between xi and yi, the two positions. Um, if they're really far apart so that their danger zones don't even overlap, we'll say that that's 1. But then we'll have that function go continuously to 0 as the distance goes down to 0. So our goal is then to find the function that contracts in, the, in this coupling, or that we can prove contracts, for the largest possible density. Um, you know, if you like, you can think of this sort of as earth mover distance. So if you took uh, something linear in L, that might already give you some improvement. But we're going to look for arbitrary nonlinear functions. Um, and by the way, you might be thinking to yourself, well, OK, so they're going to show that this continuous distance decreases exponentially over time uh, in expectation. But how do we know that the two states really coincide? So here we'll borrow this argument from Rendell and Winkler. The point is that if in my two states, the, this continuous metric is very small between them so that all of the disks are, are very close to each other in the two states, well, that means that almost all moves now will either succeed in both or fail in both. So with an additional n log n steps for coupon collecting, we will have all the disks in literally the same places. OK, so it's a kind of two-phase argument. So are you looking for the best matching between the disks? Good question. So um, we are actually mixing. Uh, our state space is actually labeled disk arrangements. So the disks have are ordered with indices 1 through n. So you're right. What if? In x, this is called disk 1, and that's called disk 2. And in y, that's reversed. We will use that idea um, by changing the indices when it, whenever it's convenient to us. So we're not going to do something sophisticated like find the minimum matching, but we'll do something kind of greedy. So um, suppose this was my previous disagreement. And I've just created a new disagreement by succeeding to move this disk in one chain and not the other, for instance. Well, now, if the cost of these two edges is less than the cost of these two edges, then I should switch which one I call xi and which one I call xj. Okay. So um, here's the special effect. <laughs> okay. um, and in particular, you know, a lot of the time yj will be quite far away so that these distances will be one anyway. And so I'll upper bound this process by simply asking, is this closer to this than this is? OK. So I'll switch whenever, that, whenever that's the case. All right, so putting this all together, um, this is going faster than I thought it would. I, if I end early, I think you'll probably forgive me. Um, OK, so now we have to do some geometry. So. But you already know the idea, so now it's just some geometry. So um, I'll use L for the distance between the two disks of the original disagreement. I'll, use, I'll suppose that something succeeds in Y and fails in X. These are the, the danger zones. And um, then I'll say that uh, I'll use S for the distance between Y and this new location Z. So what's the expected change in the distance? Uh, well, so by the way, this is called the danger crescent. It's y's danger zone minus x's danger zone. And its area, with that little latex symbol, um, is an upper bound on the probability of a bad move, okay? because a bad move can only happen if the chosen uh, z is in that crescent. So, you know, again, uh, Cannon, Mahoney, and Montenegro said, well, that's, you know, less than or equal to the area of a disk of radius 2r. But we're saying, well, if they're close together, then it's much less than that. All right, so here is the uh, expected change in the distance. Um, so uh, this is the cost of the previous disagreement. And again, if a good move occurs, that, uh, that distance disappears. So by the union bound, the probability of a good move is still at least 1 minus 4 rho. We did not play with that term. Um, we, we would like to. Uh, now, what about the probability of a bad move? Well, that's this, the area of this danger crescent. And um, we pessimistically assume that that will 
uh, create something of cost one unless this distance s is less than this distance l. So we integrate s from zero to l. This theta here tells us uh, the size of that arc that we can integrate around. Um, and then uh, if s is less than l, we swap. So we get rid of the cost dl, and we pay for this edge instead. So the savings is d of l minus d of s. OK. So yes? So are you still doing pad coupling? Yes. We're still. But, uh, I mean, your, your coupling metric, uh, your Japan function is not, is continuous now, right? Yeah. Right. So, so it does not have the usual lower bound in the path coupling theorem that says, you know, the cost of each edge is at least one, yeah. right? That's why, right, so if you follow the proof of the path coupling theorem, right, what you learn is that this continuous metric gets very small. And then we're using this argument from Randall and Winkler that says once this continuous metric is really small, right, then the symmetric differences of all these danger zones are so small so that the next n log n moves, or the next n log n successful moves will uh, cause all of the disagreements to disappear completely. And that formula is the change in the distance that you've got there, I think, rather than the new distance? Yes, this is the change in this continuous metric. Yeah. But, but, but here you're assuming all except one of the disks are exactly the same. Right. Well, we're, OK, so we are doing path coupling. So the previous x and y disagreed only at a single disk. Right. But if for that pair, we do, you know, we have this mirror image coupling. And then if we do a move and we go from one disagreement to two, well, the cost will be the cost of that new disagreement. It's, you know, if you, if you start, I mean, because this move, because this dynamics is global, typically the disk you are trying to move is very far away. If you succeed in both cases, then it might be rather close to x and y. But we pessimistically assume that we succeed in one case and not the other. So this disagreement here has cost 1, because this distance is very large. It's much larger than the radii of the disks. And even if we swap, this one would be of cost. Should I go back to the figure? No, I, mean, I just don't see the path of the argument. So for, for two mean, arbitrary configurations, configurations you, you interpolate all paths right. from one configuration to the other. But you change one continuous. disk at a time, right? So that's the that's. But the, it's okay that it's continuous. I mean, in other, I, I have a continuous metric, which is the shortest path distance defined in state space, the minimum over all paths of the sum of the continuous costs of each disagreement. Okay, so first I'm going to show that, I mean, you know, Triangle inequality and linearity of expectation, if all of those things are decreasing in expectation, so is the sum. So uh, let me interpret it right, I think. Uh, so in the usual path coupling argument, you say that if you couple adjacent things, which are at distance one, that's good enough, because you can sum out many things, right? Now right. in your case, what if several pairs differ, more than one pair differs, two pairs of x and y differ, but your distance metric is small enough that the sum of the differences is less than one. Isn't that a more basic case? Aren't you going to induction on your metric, which is continuous? Well, but I, I, am, I am only thinking, I mean, this equation, I, I am assuming that these two states had one disagreement before. They, there, there was one disk which is in different places in x and y. Totally less than one. The only reason you had that lower bound of one before is because you want to apply Markov's inequality to say when it's smaller than one, right. equal. But now he not, doesn't do that. He gets the distance down, 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 and then when it's not smaller than n squared, That's then he... One over n squared. Continuous distance down, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. But why couldn't it be that two pairs differ and the continuous distance well, It could be. No, but that would improve the argument. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean you're, you know, you're right that... 
I mean, you're right that the shortest path of single disagreements, charging me for each disagreement, um, well, let's see, I mean, you're right that that might be a bit bigger than the minimum matching. But, I, 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 but it's hard for me to think about pairs of things that disagree in more than one places, in more than one, on more than one disk, because then I can't use this mirror image coupling. But, but I mean, mirror image around what? Suppose this distance is 0 0.01, and this distance is also 0 0.01, right? So these guys are ch different in two configurations, so it's 0 0.02. You do the coupling that this 0 0.01 goes in expectation to 1 over a billion, and this 0 0.01 goes in expectation to 1 over the billion, and then you can couple everything, so together it's 2 over a billion, right? So it's the same argument that you have inside the path coupling, you know, just using the fact that you can break, the, you know, you have the triangle inequality. Once you have two differences, the distance is across the sum of one difference plus the other difference. It's possible, yeah. Okay. So that's <laughs> Well, this is, we have plenty of time. <laughs> Any other objections? Um, okay, all right. Yeah, okay, so, so, so again, th this, this bound is pessimistic in a couple of ways, but it is an upper bound. All right, so this will be contracting, so you know, this change will be minus some positive constant alpha over n, times the previous distance if, you know, flipping things around, this inequality holds. But now look, this is, you know, a linear constraint on the function d of l at various places. So it's a linear program. So now uh, we can do things like, let's uh, again, d of l is 1 whenever l is bigger than 4 times the radius because the danger zones don't overlap, so we assume that those kind of distant, those distant differences, those large differences all cost us 1. Um, and uh, so then we could, for instance, divide the interval from 0 to 4r into a bunch of subintervals and consider, well, what if d of l was constant in each subinterval? and solve this linear program. And then uh, we'll just look for the largest row for which the resulting linear program is feasible. Do you have, uh, do you have the constraints that d is a metric, or that's not necessary? We, we. That little d um, no, That's for free. Yeah, we didn't, we, you know, because that comes for free because you, I mean, why does that come for free? We didn't actually impose those constraints separately. I remember having a conversation about this two years ago. Um, and uh, but no, we, we don't impose that it's sub-additive or... Why does it come for free? Because you do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I guess we, we, between two configurations, we always interpolate by a path of, of things which just disagree at a single disk of steps has to be the Hamming distance. So, so that... I mean, it's an upper bound. I guess the point is that if it was, if the function was super additive, then you would get a smaller distance by moving the disk a little bit and then moving it a bit more as opposed to doing the, it in one step. But so as an upper bound, I think everything's okay. And you'll see in a moment that, well, here's the function we get. Um, the little zigzags here are two pixels wide. So here we divided this interval into 256 subintervals, and as we divided into more subintervals, we got slightly better lower bounds on rho, and it looks as if we're not going to do any better. Um, and of course, I can't tell you anything about whether this is actually converging to anything. Maybe you can, but so this is our metric. Um, it's kind of nice looking. You know, it, it, the other thing we tried before solving this linear program was just trying various analytic uh, forms and varying their parameters, but none of them did quite as well as this. Um, and we don't know analytically what shape this ought to be from that previous integral equation, except in the interval from 0 up to r. It looks like a straight line, but it's not quite. 
it's, it's this function. And you can work it out here because um, if, if x and y are already so close that uh, the distance between them is less than r, since this new position is it has to be at least r from y, you'll never swap. So in this case, the, the swap term just disappears, and you can just work it out. Interestingly enough, and this is just a numerical result, uh, the constraints up to here are tight, and the constraints beyond there seem to be slack. I don't know what that means. Probably it means there's something clever we could do. All right. So. 0.154, woohoo. Okay. All right, so um, how could we improve this? Well, the, you know, the, 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 the thing most crying out for improvement is this incredibly pessimistic lower bound on the probability of a good move. So again, uh, this four row is an upper bound, the union bound, on uh, the union of all the danger zones. And of course, you know, in any reasonable configuration, the danger zones overlap a lot. In fact, when you, if you're more than one quarter of the close packing density, they have to overlap, right? Does that make sense? Because otherwise, you, you know, right. So, um, but so there's kind of a basic problem here, which I think we should all uh, struggle with a little bit. So you know, what do you want to do? You want to say, oh, I'm going to couple with the stationary distribution, or I'm going to do some kind of warm start so that I'm coupling with things where the danger zones overlap a lot. But this is a path coupling argument. And the problem is that even if I'm trying to couple this state with a state drawn from the stationary distribution where there's lots of overlap, I need to think about this path through state space of individual changes. And it's not clear what I can say about the intermediate states along this path. Okay, So the overarching concern here, which we should all discuss, is how can we do path coupling in a less adversarial way? Can we get any of the warmth of a warm start into uh, the states along the path in a path coupling argument? Um, good. Yes, that's what I just said. OK. So now let's talk a little bit about spatial mixing. So um, as many of you know, uh, we'll see. OK, good. So, so if, if we, we sent this to a physics journal, uh, the Journal of Statistical Physics, which publishes lots of rigorous work in mathematical physics. And the referee report said, we don't care about this mixing time stuff. I mean, you know, don't tell us you have a good algorithm for sampling. We have really good algorithms for sampling. Ah, but if you could tell us something about spatial mixing, that would be great. So, OK. Um, because then, from, from their point of view, then you would really have a lower bound on the critical density for the appearance of the solid or even the hexatic phase. So what they want to know is that all kinds of uh, correlations, positional, orientational, anything, decay exponentially. So as many of you know, there's a long history in mathematical physics of showing that temporal mixing, the sort of optimal temporal mixing, order n log n, implies spatial mixing. And there's this nice uh, paper that takes this, as they call it, a combinatorial view, Dyer, Sinclair, Vigoda, and Weitz, um, which pr proves this by counting disagreements. These are more functional analysis flavored results that I don't fully understand. Um, this paper I really liked because I finally understood what was going on. Um, and so the argument is simply that if you mix really qu qu quickly, there just isn't time for information to get from the boundary condition deep inside the system. So we want to adapt this argument. It's, it's slightly tricky because our state space is continuous, although that turns out not to be that big a deal. Um, you know, you might briefly worry that there's uncountably many paths by which information could spread. Um, the bigger issue is that our Markov chain is non-local. So you know, if I try to move this disk over there, and there's a disagreement here, and I succeed in one case and not in the other, suddenly I have a disagreement all the way over here. So it will back teleport all the way across the system. 
Um, so we think we can handle this. So first of all, to handle the continuity, we simply divide the world into blocks of width 2R. And then if you think about it for a moment, you'll see that information can only get from each block to the eight neighboring blocks, the king's move blocks. Um, so that sort of discretizes the, the paths by which things can travel. Um, and, but then there are these teleportations. So the saving grace of the teleportations is that the probability that I choose this disk to try to move and that I happen to try to move it to that location, thus creating a disagreement over here, is order 1 over n squared. Um, whereas the local things move with probability 1 over n because I have to choose this particular area to try to move into. So we need to do some counting where we have these disagreement paths that include these jumps. So um, we can consider different boundary conditions, of course, but one kind of boundary condition we want is suppose that uh, in, the, in the y state, in addition to all the other n disks, there's also a fixed disk at the origin, OK? Or maybe a pair at some orientation, which is going to try to impose their order on the rest of the world. Um, so as in the Dyer et al. paper, if we want to bound correlations at a given distance d, we'll imagine running the Markov chain for time proportional to uh, dn for some constant. And then we'll use this triangle inequality so the equilibrium distance at a, uh, the the you know and I didn't I didn't add all the stuff given the boundary and in the patch and I, I I can only handle so many subscripts and superscripts but so we want to know that these two equilibrium distributions are close and so we do that by saying well if t is large enough to mix fairly well then the equilibrium distribution in x will be close to what we get in x after t steps the same is true for y, so then we just need to bound uh, the distance between x and y after t steps, which is the probability, um, which is the probability that a disagreement manages to spread from the origin to that patch. So there is a lemma here that we need to prove, which is um, that the total variation distance in a patch decreases exponentially. Uh, we think we can do that. OK, so then we just have to do a little combinatorics, and I'm almost done. Um, so this is just like in Dyer, Sinclair, Vigood, and Weitz. This is uh, the union bound over all these local paths. And I'm not sure if you really want to see it, but it's, it's a fun thing to do. So if you're going to uh, move a disagreement just locally, then in order to get it uh, distance d blocks away, the path has to take at least m of those. Uh, it, m steps where m is at least d. Um, we sum over all the tuples of times at which those steps could occur. This is uh, an upper bound on the number of those paths. Remember, we spread at each step to one of our eight neighboring blocks. And this is the probability with constants hidden uh, that that path would occur. And then you, get, you, you, get, you use this upper bound and get a geometric series, and it's exponentially small in D because we have to take at least D steps. So this is nice. This is what we want, right? So we want this probability to be exponentially small in D so that correlations of distance D away decay exponentially in D. All right. Well, then there are these paths with jumps. Um, so there's one piece of good news about the paths with jumps. So you might think that, OK, every local step, I get a factor of 8 because I can move in those 8 directions. So if m is the number of local steps, I would have 8 to the m. And you might think that if there are j uh, teleportation steps, since those can go anywhere, you might think I would have j to the m. The good news is I have to end up in a particular place. OK? And in order to end up in that particular place, my last jump for a given uh, terminal local path has to have been to a particular place. So it's actually j to the n minus 1. What? n to the j minus 1. Ah. Oh, right. Thank you. OK, in that case, the slide was correct.
Um, so uh, we do, you know, we just do some simple bounds. What we get is this factor one over n times something which alarmingly is growing exponentially with d. Um, that's a little nerve wracking, but it's only because we let the time grow with d and because we're doing a very naive argument where disagreements just spread. We don't take into account the fact that there is a coupling and the disagreements also disappear at a certain rate. So fine, we can cut off this exponential growth by saying don't have t continue growing with d, have it grow up to a certain point, and then what we get is that this total variation distance goes down as uh, exponentially in d with a floor which is a bit bigger than 1 over n. Is that really there or is that a fault of our analysis? So in particular, this means that we're only establishing exponential decay out to distances of about log n. And beyond that, we're saying that there's this 1 over n floor in the difference. But actually, this makes sense because how did I tell you these two states differ? I told you that in the y state, in addition to all the other disks, I have a disk or maybe two disks at the origin. So now there's just less room for all the others to move around in. There's a little bit more pressure on them. And so we think it's reasonable to say that uh, if the boundary conditions differ in the remaining volume, that there would be this floor. Okay. So this is because the number of disks is constant? No, n is going to infinity. I, I, mean, I mean, so, so the way we've defined things is that the world is the unit torus. N, n is increasing and the disks are getting smaller. So we're packing more and more of them in. But this, the, the little boundary condition in the origin is also getting smaller. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, can't you fix it by having two different boundary conditions only allowed to, they have to have the same number of spheres? Yeah, we were arguing about this, right. So, so, All the way the right. so for instance, what if in both cases there's, uh, there's a pair of disks, but there, it's just their orientation changes? This is a matter of some controversy in the um, co-authorship team on this paper. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, this analysis would have this same problem. But in that case, it, it, I, I, we're not sure about that. All right. So, I just want to end um, by saying what we all ought to be working on instead, um, instead of this single, move, single disk dynamics. Uh, and some of you know about this. In fact, I think I first heard about this from, from Dana, and then um, there was this nice thing at the Aspen Center for Physics where Tom and I got to talk to Werner Kraut a lot. So uh, Bernard and Kraut and David Wilson came up with a lovely Markov chain. So what's wrong with this Markov chain? And, and in fact, uh, Metropolis et al. By the way, there's a little story about how Metrop we shouldn't call it Metropolis et al. because apparently all Metropolis did was get the grant or something. Um, uh, so it wastes a lot of time. Once you're anywhere near the critical density, oh, try to move a disk there, you can't, do nothing. Ah, try to move it over there, you can't, do nothing. Wastes an enormous amount of time. So um, uh, Bernard Krauth and Wilson came up with a Markov chain which doesn't waste any time. It's rejection free. So what you do is you decide by golly, I am going to achieve a certain displacement, a certain distance in a certain direction. I grab a disk, I move it until it bumps into another one, I take that displacement off the, what I'm trying to achieve, I move the next one until it bumps into something else, and so on, until this total vector is my original target. Um, and in fact, they find that numerically they can do even better with an irreversible version the other thing we need to get away from is this nonsense of reversibility. So irreversible things are the hot, hot stuff in physics right now. So they find they can do very well by just having two different directions they try to move in and not, and not ever doing the reverse direction. Um, so in my dreams, we can analyze this Markov chain and show that it's, even, that it's much faster than the single disk uh, dynamics and show that we can get all the way up to the transition. Uh, this is in my dreams. 
um, maybe using these something like these tower moves for rhombus tilings from Luby Randall and Sinclair. I know it's these are good dreams. Um, and you know, because how does that Markov chain work? Well, I want to put a rhombus here. I can't, but I could if I put another one there. I can't do that, so I just move this whole tower. And they got this nice polynomial mixing time result for um, rhombus tilings as long as uh, you choose a, a, a clever distribution of the size of towers you want to try to flip. Um, so as with Swenson Wang, right, the challenge is it's very hard to make coupling arguments work for chains which change a lot of things at once. And yet, these are the chains which seem to be by far the most successful in, in physics. So they're an important challenge for us. Eric. Um, for these reversible chains, they know the stationary distribution is the same? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. The um, obvious question, I'm afraid. Um, how shall I put it? Um, have you been? How can I put this delicately? Have you been uh, brave enough to do the geometry in three dimensions? Oh, yeah, we haven't. And I think that as you went up to higher dimensions, um, the stuff that we're doing would help less and less. So in particular, OK, so, so Cannon, Montan uh, um, Cannon, Mahoney, and Montenegro, um, you know, they're, the same argument shows that rho is at least uh, 1 over 2 to the d minus 1 in d dimensions. I don't think that our arguments is, are, are going to change that asymptotics for large d. It would make some, some very tiny difference for 3. And I forget what the physics belief is about how the critical row scales. I, it, I mean, it scales, I think, exponentially, but with a different uh, constant being raised to the d. I think that's the belief. I don't recall. So the danger zones seem to be very large. Would, would you gain anything by somehow softening the edges of the danger zone? So you say that it's kind of a little bit bad if they only overlap a little bit, and very bad if they overlap a lot. Would that help with the? I'm not sure what. I mean, the disks can't overlap at all, right? They're just they're hard disks. But if the um, so I think what you're doing is you're saying you're a little bit worried about a configuration where you've got two disks whose centers are closer than four uh, R, right? But that that's a binary decision. Either you're worried about this pair of disks or you're not. I, I'm maybe I'm misinterpreting. I mean, it's more like we know the situation is much better than it is because we know that the uh, union of the danger zones has a total size much less than 4R because, you know, so in, in other words, we're, we're pessimistically imagining, right, because what do we want? We want to imp we, we would like to improve the probability of a good move. The probability of a good move is the fraction of the world left over after you remove all the danger zones. We're pessimistically assuming the danger zones don't overlap. So if given that the danger zones overlap, there's actually a lot more room left over for good moves than in our analysis. But we don't know how to make that rigorous because it's a path coupling argument, and it would not be enough to say the end point of the path is a typical state. OK. So. OK, one more question, I think, then we'll have to. Oh, this is just going right back to the beginning. So, so you said that. Um, there couldn't be a phase where the correlations don't decay at all, where you have sort of infinite range. This is this Peirce so, argument, yeah. So, so obviously in a lattice-based model you can, but there's something special about continuous models where you can Yes. And um, it's, it's a classic argument which I would have to look on Wikipedia before I could really uh, re reproduce it for you. But, and, it's, and it's particular to two dimensions. So, you know, in one dimension, of course, with any non-zero temperature, things have to decay exponentially. In two dimensions, they have to decay polynomially if things are continuous. And it's, um, uh, you know, there are just not enough paths to get information far away uh, in two dimensions. So in three or more dimensions, you can have the correlations 
go to a constant. So kind of the 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 slogan is that you can't really have crystals in two dimensions, but you can in three or more. Some lattice structure or something. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, uh, I think uh, time is pressing on. Thanks. Uh, so